Okay guys, we're going deeper into the mine. Let's see if we can find more gold. Well, if anybody missed it, my name's John, I'm your tour guide, and we're here at the entrance to the Eagle Mine. The Eagle Mine was opened up by a guy named Billy Moran back in 1870, and right here we have this big cement slab next to the tunnel. Uh, this is where all the big rock crushing machines were bolted down during the mining days, uh, extracting all the gold, silver, and copper out of the really hard quartz rock. Now, uh, we still have the original ore cart the miners used to hand push 2,000-pound um, loads of rock out of the tunnel in. The rusty square ore cart is still parked on its original cart tracks here in the gravel, and the original cart tracks from the whole length of the tunnel we're about to walk through, so you do have to kind of watch your step as you go through. Now, back in the mining days, this was actually kind of fast-paced work. It was pretty busy and hectic, so a lot of the rich pieces of stone got misplaced on the hillside instead of reaching the crusher. Now we've spent a little bit of time gathering up just some of those rocks that were blasted out of the hill by the miners. Um, you can see gold, silver, and copper in all these rocks here, but this rock here is the richest stone on the wall for sure. If you take a close look at this kind of dark patch on top of the stone, it's really dense with powdered gold, silver, and copper. You can see it sparkle like microscopic glitter. Mm -hmm. But everybody should take a look at the front side of this rock. About halfway down, we have a whole row of pretty big gold flake embedded in the rock. We're going to see a lot of gold in the tunnel walls on our way through today, and that's what you're looking for right there. Mm. Now, I also get to tell you about some of the hardships they had to deal with back then. Uh, it was mostly because of a lack of technology at the time. They didn't have a lot of the neat things we enjoy nowadays, like electricity. Um, we have 235 gold mines in Julian. They all opened the same year, 1870, quite a while before we were commonly using electricity. They never had electric power run through the tunnels in the mining days. This was the workers' only light for a 12-hour shift underground. And when he starts work in the tunnel, uh, that worker's carrying his little lunch pill with him. They take their lunch break underground too. Uh, now during that 12 hours underground, each miner is gonna go through a whole pocket full of these little candles, lighting one with the other like a chain smoker as they burn down. Um, but the sardine can behind the candle, that was the most popular chunk of metal as a reflector dish for these mine workers. I really don't think it did a lot for the candlelight, but it did keep your hat from catching on fire if you dropped your hammer on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Probably more helpful that way. Uh, now, just inside the tunnel on the left wall, we have a, a big collection of antique drilling bars. Uh, most of these bars go to power tools that were never used here. They're just old relics they brought in. But the first drill bar on the top on this set, that's a hand drill bar. And I'll be talking about that a little bit when we get upstairs. Um, when we're upstairs and I'm talking about the powder bands tool set, we don't have a drill bar up there. Uh, it's right here at the entrance. So let's get into the mine tunnel now. Uh, just take a look at this one as you pass by it. Notice it has kind of a flared out star shape on the end. That helped with the drilling action as they drill four foot holes in the rock for blasting. We might need to scoot in a little bit more. Now this uh, this first stop in the tunnel, I tell a little bit of a story right here. Um, gold was first discovered in Julian by a cattle rancher named Fred Coleman back in October 1869. And 1869 was a pretty severe uh, rain season. Um, it was most likely we were having an El Nino effect that year. Uh, the whole west coast got hammered with severe storms and a lot of flooding. Well, the floodwaters stirred up all the sand in our streams that year. So that October, as Fred Coleman rode his horse over this mountain, he stopped at a nearby stream to let his horse get a drink of water, and he could see gold all over the sand. Oh. So he grabbed his cast iron skillet and started panning. 
Well, he got a whole ounce of gold pretty fast, so he knew he had a really big find here. With his one little ounce of gold, Fred Coleman started his long horse ride all the way to downtown San Diego, where you can cash in back then. But Fred Coleman was a big, happy, friendly kind of a guy. He loved to meet new people and talk their ears off all day. So every person he saw on the road on his way to the bank that day, he uh, got all excited, jumped off his horse, and started talking about the piles and mountains of gold he saw up here. He single-handedly set off the third gold rush to California. Um, within six months, 14,000 people showed up here just to come get the gold. Now, only two weeks after his discovery, a couple of tough guys were chasing a bear over this hill. That's when they stumbled across the top side of this quartz vein right here. Now, when those two guys were standing on top of this hill, looking down on this long stripe of rock they found, they could see the gold, silver, and copper in the stone, like the walls, the rocks I showed you outside. Um, so only two weeks into this big gold rush, they discovered where the gold in the streams came from. Right away, they had survey teams come out from everywhere. They mapped out every quartz vein in the mountain range. By the time the big rush of people panned all the gold out of the streams, uh, they already had their plans in place where they were going to start blasting in to come get the rest of it. You can see some of the gold they were after yep. in this part of the vein here. Yeah, that's real gold in the ceiling. Uh, this is a fairly rich quartz vein, too. Uh, this was giving the miners two ounces of gold for each ton of the rock, so they were making good money the whole time they worked here. Now, you see the striped rock on either side of the quartz vein? This was useless heavy rock to the miners back then, but it is what let the gold come to the surface originally. Um, this other rock, this is a sedimentary stone. That's what gives it the neat stripe pattern. We're actually standing inside a pretty big slab of the ancient seafloor here. With the wild geologic activity we have in this part of the world, over the last 300 million years, it's been breaking off enormous slabs of the ocean floor and slowly pushing them up on their side, stacking them up over time like books on a bookshelf. 170 million years ago, we had a volcanic event here. This is a little simplified, but basically, a lot of magma was welling up from deep in the earth, squeezing through the cracks of the seafloor rock, bringing the precious metals up to the surface. That's why they're only after these quartz veins. Now I have an old picture to show everybody over here. There's a little guy standing in the middle. That's Billy Murray and the mine owner, so we get to see what he looked like back then. Uh, but Billy's standing next to his house he lived in, his old mine shack. Now those 14,000 people that flooded into the hills in the first six months of the gold find, our government lured most of those people out here with a homesteading grant. Um, like I said, this is a third gold rush to California. The government was a little more ready this time. As soon as the government heard of this new gold rush, they set up the homesteading grant right away to lure as many people out here as possible to get a head start working the gold out of the ground. Um, but with that homesteading grant, once somebody traveled all the way out here and got a job at one of these mines, well, this new mine job pays today's equivalent of around $30 an hour. It's a pretty good job. On top of that, the government's going to hand that worker a free half acre of land for traveling out here and getting that job. And as soon as possible, that worker needs to build his own little mine shack to live in. It's not always sunny California here. Um, but once someone has done all that, um, this is the reason the town of Julian's still here today and not a ghost town like a lot of our other mine tours in America. Once someone has gotten all that done, they have a good job at a mine and a free house to live in, it's pretty easy to find a girl in town willing to marry and start a family. And that's really what happened. We have a huge flood of people that just came out here to get the gold, but then they settled and the town of Julian sprang up with a pretty big community to start with. It's really good for us nowadays because they make the best apple pie in the world, right? <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. All right, if you haven't tried the pie up here, I definitely hit one of the pie shops before you leave town today. Mm -hmm. um, and you can always get Julian pie, you know, anywhere down the city. Uh, <laughs> Okay guys, we're going deeper into the mine. Let's see if we can find more gold. Now, uh, the first quartz vein I was kind of going on about back there, remember I said they were getting two ounces of gold from each ton of that rock? That all by itself would have kept really nice profits coming out of the mine the whole time they worked here. But once they reached what they named the star vein here, they started getting 10 to 12 ounces of gold from each ton of this rock. So the mine profits really hit the roof. And this is really why over the course of 64 years, Billy Moran became a pretty rich guy. Um, when all the mining in Julian shut down in 1934, 
Billy Moran had saved up over six hundred thousand dollars. That's, That's millions in today's money. Yeah. And uh, he was a pretty good guy. He wasn't greedy, so that was plenty to just retire at the end of the mine days. Um, he lived the rest of his life out right here in Julian, and he's still here today. Um, he's a couple hilltops over at the public cemetery. <laughs> 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 now, because of the gold richness in this quartz vein and how superstitious we were back in those days, instead of blasting both directions and taking all the gold, they went 200 feet this way, and on this side of the tunnel here, they cleaned up the quartz vein and kept it on display as a good luck turn for the gold mine. And every miner that worked here for 64 years would always start his 12-hour shift the same way. His first trip through the tunnel, he's going to wipe the rock for luck on this spot. And decades of miners swiping their hand across the hard stone once a shift polish the rock up and you can really see how much gold's in the wall. But if anybody wants to go get a lottery ticket after the tour, you can grab some luck right here. Um, the first thing before you start blasting is you hire an engineering team. Uh, they're going to try to anticipate every problem you might face down the way. So um, they had a good idea of everything they were going to do from the start. Um, that engineering team is going to make sure that you mine through a, a nice rich quartz vein. They're also going to make sure that you don't overlap any other mine claims no matter how far down you go. And they were really good at their jobs too. Um, probably just as good as they are today. It's just nowadays we have all this technology to work with, you know, all these techno toys. Um, but to give you an idea how good they were, um, they maintained this gentle uphill slope on purpose through the tunnel um, because when the ore cart is full of rock, it weighs 2,600 pounds. You push the heavy cart downhill and the empty cart uphill. There you go. Uh, we, had, we have two mines joined together up ahead. Uh, they blasted these mines together from both directions while maintaining that gentle uphill slope. They're pretty good at their jobs. Now, uh, right here, we've reached the end of the Eagle Mine. It's a pretty small gold mine. Uh, the Eagle Mine has one level, and we just walked the main tunnel. I can still see sunshine at the other end. It's a pretty small mine. As we walk through the support structure behind me, we're walking into the bigger High Peak Mine. The High Peak Mine has 11 mine levels in it, 11 floors, and we're going to walk into it right in the middle on level 6. And this is really rare, too. These are completely separate private mines back then. Uh, they don't join different mines together underground like this. What happened here is when World War I broke out, it was more of an economic event for mining in America, it caused a bit of a stock market crash. And here in Julian, as soon as that market crash dragged the price of gold below profit lines, all 235 of these gold mines in Julian shut down to wait out the war at home. Um, but as soon as they started that break, our government stumbled with the war a little bit and wanted help from the public to support the war effort. They asked everybody in America to donate all the scrap metal they can find to help out. The Smith brothers that owned the High Peak Mine gave away everything. Um, almost all their ore carts and their entire processing building went as a donation to the war effort. All the big rock crusher machines, even the metal roof disappeared. Uh, so when the war was over, they had no way to restart the gold mine. The only thing that saved the High Peak Mine from being abandoned is the first day these two mines opened, the Smith Brothers hit it off with Billy Moran. They became like best buddies. So when World War I was over, it was basically a few friends just trying to help each other keep going. They had a big meeting and decided to blast level 6 through the Eagle Mine so the Smith Brothers could send all their rock this way. From then on, they would just rent time on Billy Moran's crushing mill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little cold in the tunnel all year. It does. It cools off, huh? How about now, the summertime? What's that? How about like August? Uh, it's uh, This is a natural effect of being underground. It stays yeah. close to 62 degrees does for the it? entire year. Oh, okay. Yeah, whether it's uh, 14 mm -hmm. degrees outside or 110. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's always nice and cool in the tunnels. Actually, during the winter days, uh, it actually feels kind of warm in here. It's really? the same temperature. Though. Yeah, there you go. Now, uh, since these miners spend their entire 12-hour shift underground, if they break tools while they're working, they have to fix them in the tunnel, too. They did a little tunnel widening right over here to put in this workbench, and the other end of this tunnel to the right, um, tucked in behind the stairs, we're going to climb to go to level 5. You can see all the forge equipment is still set up. 
But if we scoot up here and uh, look behind this red gate, you can see the main access shaft for the mine. So let's uh, scoot up a little right here. Yeah, you look at that big hole in the floor on the other side of this gate. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's the main access shaft, and it's the only way to reach the lower mine levels underneath us here. That would be level 7 through 11. Yep, and even though Mr. Boswell was the big boss here in the mine, uh, he didn't get any mahogany office desk. Um, they just dragged an old plank of plywood for him to do his paperwork at. That's so I can't see, I can't see. But right now I'm going to use this candle to show everybody what it was like to be a mine worker here a hundred years ago with that goofy candle hat. So let's get in a little bit more. Get my candle lit and take a seat on this jug of gunpowder. Is everybody ready? Okay, let's turn all the lights off. Okay, here we go. Oh. Hmm. Let's turn off the phone screen too. Um, now, uh, this is all the light they get the whole 12 hours underground. Even when they're doing some teamwork on a task, like doing the setup for blast, one worker will keep his candle lit, everyone else blows theirs out to conserve oxygen. So this really is all the light they get for their 12 hours underground. If you get close to the wall with the candle hat, you can see the quartz frame pretty good, and you might even see a sparkle of gold in the rock. But remember, there's no matches allowed in these mine tunnels during the mine days. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it would be like if you're sent to go fetch a tool somewhere and you trip over the cart track? Oh. <laughs> yeah, whoops. Oh, wow. You're left in some pitch darkness and you have to make your way outside like this to get your candle relit. Braille. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any questions here? No. All right, that means I'm doing plenty of talking right. still. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to be on our way out of the gold mine now. I'm going to get okay. to the other end of the group. We're going to go? Yeah. We'll do some panning. Now, from this point right here, we have about 300 feet of tunnel block this way, and we'll be out in the sunshine again. Uh, but a little way. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> we made it out. Feels kind of like dizzy over inside. I wasn't spending 12 hours in there <laughs> with a candle. Well, we all made it out alive, right? Yeah. yeah. I always bring most of us. Hey guys, that was the end of the tour. All right, guys, that was the Eagle Mine Incorporated. Um, that was a tour. It was interesting. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And we'll see you in our next video. Thanks. Yeah. Keep watching. Thank right. you.